What is going on, guys? I'm here with my buddy, Chef Andrew Grohl. How are you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing well. And how are you doing? I'm good, man. Making it, man. We have like a nor'easter here on the East Coast, um, yeah. which I know, you're, I know you're from New Jersey originally, right? Yep, you got it. Nice, man. Well, um, thanks for hanging out. Uh, you've been all over the place, I know, with uh, with all the uh, pushback uh, with Governor Newsom and such over in California. But before we jump into that, maybe you can kind of fill everybody in on your background and kind of what got you this place. Oh, boy. So, uh, how many hours do we have? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, so I mean, my background, uh, you know, grew up in Jersey, we started at, uh, you know, 14, 15 years old, working in the restaurant industry, never anticipated that it would be my, you know, my destiny. Mm -hmm. I went to a small liberal arts college up in Maine studying, you know, piano performance. Uh, and uh, while I was doing that, I was working in the lobster and I was working in restaurants, finally realized that was the avenue through which I wanted to, you know, kind of expand my career. So I left college got into the restaurant industry, went back to school, got my culinary arts degree, actually went back to business school within that food service uh, management program, continued working at restaurants throughout the United States, places as big as the Ritz Carlton, you know, and as small as opening up my own 10, 15 seat bistro. Um, and uh, along the way, found a love for seafood, really, really was a passion project of mine. And when the economy took a dump in 2009, I left my restaurant position in New Jersey where I was running a couple restaurants, you know, 500 seats underneath me. And I took a position with the Aquarium of the Pacific in oh, cool. Long Beach, California. And uh, that the, the role of that position was really to connect chefs with sustainable seafood sources and to ultimately understand the seafood supply chain with the goal of trying to get people to eat more seafood, more of the right types of seafood. So after a couple of years of working within that program, I uh, kind of put my money where my mouth was and I, I launched my own sustainable seafood concept as a food truck because it was really hard raising capital in 2011, um, you know, still kind of in the midst of a recession. And uh, I started that. That was called Flatfish. We opened our first brick and mortar about eight months later and have since grown that into a multi-unit restaurant group, both company owned and franchised. And, uh, you know, I've kind of been running hands on, still strapping everything since 2012. You know, real owner operator, run a family. They all work within the business, and uh, here we are. Okay. That's awesome, man. Yeah, and uh, you've done some cool things with the industry. Um, so, was it being in Boston that got you really excited about seafood? You know, all over. I mean, growing up in yeah. Jersey, with understanding yeah. the coast and fishing. Um, yeah. You know, you know Boston, certainly Maine. Then when I worked on the West Coast, I was living out in Oregon. I did my apprenticeship out in Portland, so that gave me the opportunity mm -hmm. to kind of work within the world of Pacific Northwest seafood. Um, so nice, man. Well, um, all right. So you uh, you've gotten in uh, the social media world, specifically Twitter in a little bit of a tizzy um, in a good way, for sure, for all of us um, pushing back on Governor Newsom. And they're basically saying, hey, no dining outdoors. Uh, so they're trying to push everything to, to go and delivery, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we're seeing that same effect uh, across the country with certain governors. And I think just in general, the restaurant industry has been an unfair. It's been they've been unfairly targeted. I mean, we're really the scapegoats here when I think it comes to trying to s control this virus. Um, um, so I've been very outspoken about the arbitrary nature by which some of these policies are put in place, specifically the ban on outdoor dining. And for months, we understood that this virus was diluted in the outdoors. Get outside, get outdoors, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're being told we have to shut down, which is only going to force people indoors, whereby the, the virus itself can replicate. Right. So uh, Secretary of Health, I believe, for California, I pull a quote uh, from him from an article. He said, the decision to include outdoor dining and limiting that, turning to restaurants to, to deliver and provide takeout options instead, really has to do with the goal of trying to keep people at home. So like you said, there's really no scientific basis that it spreads the virus more. It's really just to keep people at home. But then the question is, well, all right, people are congregating in, in malls and Target and Walmart and, and on planes. W where do you draw the line? Exactly. And why does the government get to choose where the line is drawn um, without any science to back that, you know, that scribble, if you will? You know, if, if the goal is to keep people at home, then we should all be told to stay home and we should be written checks individually, not through agencies, not through businesses. We should all get checks to stay home and see the effect that it has across 
all coronavirus cases cases nationwide or statewide. But they'll never do that, right? Because they understand that they can't by virtue of the special interests, the lobbyists, the relationships they have with a lot of these big corporations. And I think it's all laying bare right now. For sure. And I can't remember the name of the uh, the restaurant, but I think it's out there near you in LA and the lady who had the, the outdoor dining. I assume you guys spend much money on outdoor dining stuff too, which maybe we can talk about, but she spent much money on outdoor dining, had her patio set up and then Lily, she couldn't do that. But then right next door to her, there was a, a movie production with a catering set up. It looked identical almost. Yeah. And look, you know, tragedy, what happened to her, but I'm also glad that she was able to, uh, visualize the hypocrisy for the rest of America in such a real specific and concise manner because yes the entertainment can continue entertainment industry can of course continue to operate because look Los Angeles we all know this Hollywood Los Angeles they are beholden to the entertainment industry so they can continue to operate they can break all of their own rules and yet us restaurants are shut down so it doesn't work that way right viruses aren't able to discriminate based upon industries based upon time of the day I mean, this thing is an out of control virus. And that's one thing that everybody can agree upon. You know, the effect and the groups that it targets. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I can at least understand and recognize that, you know, that we, we can't be selective with the ways in which we manage this. Absolutely. So I, um, I got a, a comment from someone earlier. I'm blanking on his name, but he was coming coming from a, a con contradictory point saying, well, all right, Gavin Newsom, yeah, he goes to French Laundry with his you know, 20 buddies or eating inside. Yeah, that's not okay. But then his argument was, well, just because he's doing something wrong doesn't mean that you sh you guys should you know, follow in his footsteps. But you guys are doing certain things to ensure that people are, are safe and distance and, and y'all are not doing indoor dining at all, right? We're not doing indoor dining because we feel as if it, right now there's it, there's no reason to take that risk on. I mean, we're able to take advantage of 75 degrees sunny weather and beautiful outdoor dining spaces. And we do know that obviously indoors is there's a little bit of a higher risk factor. Now, as to how high that risk factor is, you know, I'll, I'll let people in states where they don't have the opportunity for outdoor dining, you know, fight that fight. But for me, that, that that's a... That's a real comment that your friend made in regards to, yeah, well, if Newsom does something wrong, that doesn't necessarily mean what he's doing is right and that we should continue to break the rules. Two wrongs don't make a right, to use the age of the cliche. However, it's not just that one instance. It's the people he was dining with, number one. Mm -hmm. They're all of his health lobbyists and the health minister for the state of California. And number two, what it actually did was it didn't just shine a light on his own hypocrisy. It shined a light on the hypocrisy of all of the leaders out there who are breaking their own rules. So if one person was breaking their own rules, okay, maybe they're just adults. But if every single one of the leaders that are putting these lockdowns in place are breaking their own rules, well, there's a pattern there that's incredibly worrisome. Yeah, for sure. So you guys have restaurants all over the country, I believe in UK as well. Um, what what are the different situations like in the different states? Are, are, are I assume sales are down, but are they you know functioning and open for the most part? Yes. Yeah, so collectively, sales are down across the board year on year, yeah. everywhere. Um, you know, that's just the reality of our economy right now it, for any industry except Target, Walmart, Amazon or the mm -hmm. third party delivery apps. But what we see in different states between, for example, Georgia, South Carolina, Florida is, is that uh, people are dining out and they're, you know, they're doing so respectfully and they're doing so in a safe manner. We're able to take advantage of some of the indoor dining. Um, and even if you look at some of these states, right, like Florida right now in the death per Yes, per uh, million people, or is it 100,000? Florida ranks 21 on the list, and they're completely open. Um, and then you look across the board at states that have intense lockdowns, and they're number one, two, or three on the list of deaths per 100,000. So for somebody who looks at numbers from time to time, there's, just, there's something confusing in there. And I'm not advocating for one strategy or another, but I do think that it at least allows us an opportunity to look across the spectrum to see how some of these, these – um, processes and, and procedures have had an effect on numbers. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I, I think I saw you bring up in a tweet or something at some point was the fact that, you know, I'm sort state certified. You are, I'm sure I, I teach the class, I do consulting and everything. So like we've been thinking about these things, you know, sanitizing and you know, properly washing your hands, you know, for a long time, unlike other industries. Yeah. Yeah. 
I we're all we in California. It's mandatory that we all have our food handlers card, and then of course, Serve Safe is kind of one step above that. But even just the very basic entry level sanitation knowledge is is, right. is is paramount to anybody even working in this industry. And I highly doubt that anybody at Walmart or any of these retail stores mm-hmm. are understanding the ways in which they have to maintain a sanitary system across the workplace. And we're seeing that because a lot of the spread in these coronavirus cases come from employees within the industries that are exempt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame. Well, you've been a great voice and you've helped raise a bunch of money. You uh, you and your wife, who's now your partner with the restaurants um, and the Slapfish team, y'all created a GoFundMe. I know y'all have so far raised $30,000 um, five days in, which is incredible. Um Maybe I have, I have a link to that. Maybe I can go ahead and share that in the comments. Um, but yeah, go ahead and um, speak about that for a second, if you don't mind. Of course. So, you know, we realized when there wasn't going to be a relief package that came down to help any of the, uh, you know, struggling employees within the restaurant industry or the restaurants themselves, that we would at least try and put our best foot forward and try and raise money and distribute that money to struggling or out of work restaurant workers, you know. It obviously came about because we got a ground swell of support when we said that we were going to be remaining open outside. And everyone kept writing to me and saying, hey, can we donate money to your restaurant? Can we give you money? And the last thing I want to do is use this as an opportunity to grift to try and personally enrich my own business. But I said to them, you can do one of two things. You can support your own community restaurants by buying gift cards or doing takeout as opposed to third party delivery. Or... We'll start this fund whereby you can donate even a dollar and then we will aggregate those funds and we'll disseminate them in denominations of no more than $500 to restaurant workers who are struggling, have lost hours or are completely out of work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's awesome, man. Good, good for you guys. So Slapfish, you, you know, y'all are across the country. Um, I assume you guys have had some maybe you know calls with with the different franchisees um with your team do you, did you guys set up a, a company-wide uh policy or do you get let everybody kind of do their thing how'd that work most of our franchisees are all independently operating in a manner that you know state actually all of them are operating in a manner that okay. stick to the specific sanitary guidelines related to coronavirus and and just in general sanitation um and they're all really good operators as well so we try not to micromanage in that regard. Um, we had, you know, in the beginning, we obviously set forth certain operating protocols in in order to remain safe. Um, but for us specifically, when I speak out about outdoor dining, I am only speaking on behalf of our corporate owned restaurants in Southern California. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you heard from the other the franchisees as well as you guys have a bunch uh, company owned as well? How has the situation with landlords? Have they been understanding? Have they been worked with you guys? How has that worked? Yeah, the the relationship with landlords is all across the board. I mean, we've had some yeah. landlords that have just said, screw it, you're on your own. We'd have some landlords that have really helped us out. And we've had other landlords that have kind of towed the line and, you know, um, been somewhat evasive, but also uh, they, they're waiting for their own relief. And I understand that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so getting through this as an industry um you know, there's there's kind of two parts of the equation there's there's kind of you know live another day you know get some sales be creative you know i know you guys did that early on and i assume we're continuing to and then there's the other part which is um you know the independent restaurant coalition is working to get the the stimulus package uh passed i know right now they i think the senate agreed on you know 300 million uh or 300 billion which they didn't seem to think it was enough, um, but have you have you been involved with that at all? Have you uh, how's how do you look at that? I haven't worked with any groups or agencies um, right now. I think it's um, how can I say this and be diplomatic? I think that some of these associations um, are politically handcuffed uh, and they mm-hmm. can't really speak out in the ways in which I can as an individual. Yeah, I think we all need to be careful about what we say, because by no means do any of us want to put anyone in a risky situation and nor do we want to um, create consternation and strife between us and, and those who are setting policy, whereby it's a complete free for all. But we also do need to be pragmatic with our approach. And the beauty of social media now is, is that I can speak out and I can address hundreds of thousands of people 
in a way that I couldn't do 10 years ago. So these associations are a bit behind, I think, on some of that. And it's not all about relief packages and money. It's also about being open and honest about the effect that some of these lockdowns are having um, mm. on the long-term viability of the industry because we're shutting down the industry and there's it's just kind of like, so what? Deal with it. What are you going to do? Yeah, you lost your savings. So be it. Yeah, and I think just looking at the numbers, uh, I saw a report that was you know, 16 million restaurant workers before all this started. I think right now there's around 10 million. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the, what the industry looks like in two years from now. Um, I don't know. We'll see. A little demolition man, you know, Taco Bell on every corner. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, what about um, – what else did I have here? Um, I'm trying to read my handwriting. Um, so you uh, you posted some tweets about um, running for governor or, or uh, posing uh, uh, Newsom. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But uh, if you're to sit down and talk with him, what would you say? Well, you know, I would ask him to answer me as a human, answer these businesses as a human and not a number on a spreadsheet, and ask him why he hasn't spoken directly to the people on Main Street and given them – his confidence, he's going to take care of them, right? Because every time he's posed a question on the podium and they ask about these regulations and these lockdowns and these shutdowns, all he does is reference back the need to save lives and obviously the danger of this virus. And I don't think anyone questions that. But you can have – they aren't mutually exclusive thoughts. You can be very, very, very cognizant of the danger of this virus while also being aware and sensitive and empathetic the plight of those of us who are completely losing everything and he needs to speak to those people as well does he come from a business background i don't even know um his kind yeah. of history so um you know newsom had a, had, a, had a rough upbringing i mean you know he was raised i think by a single mother i mean he worked his butt off so he definitely worked as a young child he he eventually partnered with one of the getty um sons i think and they fully invested in plump jack winery and he started plump jack oh, winery okay. And uh, that's exploded, and that was his business background. So you know, it's not it's not my place at all to to, to poke at his history and, and what experience he's had because I've never walked a mile in his shoes. But I will say is that um, he's an he's an amazing orator. He's got a hell of a head of hair, and uh, <laughs> you know, I just think that there's a bit of the human element that's missing, and I think that's why he's being his feet are being held to the fire. Yeah, yeah. The reason I was asking about that was it's it's kind of I feel like some of these politicians have been in the in the political world for so long, it's kind of like, you know, when you have like, you know, culinary teachers, instructors, they know how things work in culinary school, but kind of forget how it is in, in the restaurant industry. Yeah. It's in like every world. economist, every economist working in higher education has never actually worked a job where they've had to balance a checkbook. <laughs> right. Right. But it sounds like, I mean, he, he should at least be empathetic to the fact that there's a lot of people out there in his state and across the country that are obviously really struggling. Yeah. Um, so, um, again, the, I have the link to the, uh, the restaurant uh, relief fund that you, you guys started over at Slapfish. Um, just talk real quick about kind of you and, and, and y'all's expansion. I know you so you started with a food truck. You um, branched out from there. Um, awesome concept. What, um, what have you learned in, in scaling? Um, keep it simple. Right. If you're going to scale, you got to keep it simple. You're never going to be able to replicate yourself, your passion and your attention to detail. So you always need to assume that you're going to get a C minus from anybody else who's trying to replicate it. And I don't say that to be cynical. It's just that's how we are as perfectionists. So as long as you focus on a few things and scale those perfectly, then you can start to pepper in the package, if you will. You know, I think I made a mistake of trying to scale something that was a bit too large and I've had to scale it back, if you will. As in like. The recipes might have been standardized, but kind of too complex. And, and you also want to make sure that if you have if the lobster roll in Huntington Beach, you have the same lobster roll in Hilton Head. Yeah, bingo, bingo, right? So, so menu size, yeah, recipe complexity, but also like your mission, your motto, the culture, mm -hmm. the company culture, and the brand that you're building. Make sure that it's easy to understand. You, that, you know, we're all as, as entrepreneurs, we're conflicted with what I call the curse of knowledge. And to us, it just seems so commonplace. But to, to the average everyday person who's trying to understand what we're trying to, um, you know, what we're trying to sell, literally and figuratively, yeah. it, 
it's not as simple. How, how would you describe y'all's culture? <clears throat> Honest, authentic. You know, for us, it's about making it matter. And that comes first. And that's both internally and externally. And I, I assume in all of this, you've kind of, I mean, if you don't take care of your employees, then you're not going to have employees. Um, they kind of come first. So like making sure that they're safe and protected before anything else, I assume, right? Yep. Yep. We need their buy-in and our employees are our greatest, are, are, they are our, they're our family members, right? So that's what it comes down to. As I had mentioned on one of my tweets, you yeah, know, it's when you set up this, this, this fund, we're looking through because, you know, you get the notification and you can see right. the one of the first people to donate was one of our 19 year old counter sales team members. It's like, this is somebody who's gotten their hours significantly cut, hits are reduced. I know they're hurting and struggling, and yet they're putting money in to help other people. Like that's the culture we want. Yeah, and the only way to build that is is through you know bringing them in to be a, to be a part of it and having a mission yeah. bigger than just yourself. That's awesome, yeah. man. Of course, it's modeling, right? Yeah, that's awesome, man. So, uh, what what are the um, what are the kind of goals? I mean, obviously to kind of stay afloat and keep things moving. Are you guys going to continue to expand uh, the, 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 the footprint? What are your thoughts with, with that? Yeah, it's hard to even consider those t those those topics right yeah. now in the midst of what's going on. I mean, because well, we're expanding into an unknown. Th there might be a, a bunch of uh, – because I'm looking to get back into the re restaurant game at some point, and there might be some uh, cheap real estate and some leveraging bargaining power with uh, landlords. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, that's the sad reality of the situation. The last thing you want to do is stand on somebody's back in order to, you know, enrich yourself. But if it, if, if it's that, um, at, at the expense of, uh, yeah. Amazon or Walmart, then go for it. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the other day you posted a tweet, uh, I think it was a local restaurant owner. I think it was a Mexican place and, uh, John Gordon, responded hey i'll throw him a thousand bucks that was awesome um yeah it's it's cool to see how has i know you said you didn't want to use the the um the the opportunity you've, you've had you you've been all over with you know fox news and um we're all you, you've been everywhere it seems like um you've been on all sorts of uh, different news shows um, getting a lot of press for, for you, for Slapfish. Uh, you said you didn't want to use that to, to just for yourselves, but I assume in a certain sense it has helped sales. Yeah, at some stores it has helped sales, certainly. Um, you know, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't the case, but I also think that that's, that's just a result of us busting our butt to and standing up and and showing what we can do as opposed to just rolling over i mean that's really what this comes down to is just that yeah. we've got to understand that we've got individual liberties and we've got to stand up for what's right and you know in the beginning when it was 15 days to slow the spread everybody was on board with that um we're 10 months in right now and there doesn't seem to be an answer we haven't gotten the relief package republicans and democrats can't even agree on you know what special interests they want to bake into these bills and there's a certain point at which you say guys move over we're going to take over small business, community driven businesses. We're, we're going to make the rules here. Mm -hmm. I, I saw uh, that I guess the California restaurant association filed a lawsuit um, to the state uh, against, against well, LA County. Yeah. Oh, LA County. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, because of these outdoor dining bands. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and I was, I was watching a video uh, the other day. It was actually a, a, it was a Harvard, um, uh, he's some sort of you know, doctor, and he, he studies basically like the, the spread of, of air and all that kind of stuff. And the way the, the analogy he made was so if we're in like a confined room and someone's smoking a cigarette, that you're going to be able to tell there's a cigarette smoke kind of everywhere. If you're outside, you have like the free, free flowing air, you have the wind, and it's going to kind of move that along. So the possibility of, of getting um, the, the cigarette smoke on you or, or stuck with you is you know far far less mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um analogy yeah um I, yeah I thought, I thought it was good um have you guys so what you guys have you implemented i, I know you said i was you and brett thorne talk at one point this is what probably six months ago when this all kind of got started but you guys um you had like the hand sanitizer you know stations all over the place you were opening the doors uh for for guests 
What um what all have you guys done? Yeah, I mean, hand sanitizer, we've added another register so that if there is a line, we can decrease the line as quickly as possible so people aren't standing on top of one another um, like we see at a lot of stores right now. Um, we've got uh, – we changed our – operations model so that we can have less people in the kitchen at one time. We've actually co-packed all of our scratch made sauces throughout this process so that now we we no longer have those people in the back of the kitchen jamming out all these sauces where unfortunately, you know, the immediate result might be that we lose one unit of labor, but we can cross train them and use them at other stores. But what happens is it decreases the concentration in the kitchen itself. There's a lot of real strategic operational things that we can do in order to create a safer work environment that I think are being missed in some of the cliches that we're hearing about, like, you know, socially distance and use your, use your sanitizer and wear a mask. We all know that stuff, but right. How can we even take a step beyond such that our operations can inherently maintain those socially social distancing guidelines? Yeah. And, and like, you know, I look at college sports down with Alabama, um, yeah. And, and yeah, man, uh, roll tide. And, um, but you know, they, uh, the, the coaches, was, you know, football or basketball, they're talking about like, you know, like we feel like our, our, our students are safer here than anywhere else. You know, otherwise they're out kind of, you know, hanging out with their friends back home or whatever else. And so if you can kind of create that safe environment at work, um, by doing these things, it, it makes things better for everybody. Um, and it can make some money and you know, you know, pay the bills at the end of the day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and that, that same theory can be extrapolated across what we're seeing right now with restaurants, because I think there was a chart I saw yesterday in New York and it said something like 75 percent of cases happen within our own household. One point two percent of cases happen within restaurants. So we're shutting down restaurants to tell people to go live under their own roof. But yet we're moving them from a less risky area to a high risk area. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um I saw there's another comment from someone earlier too that su suggested. So there's no data that suggests COVID spreads outside. Um, they were company kind of devil's advocate. Is there no data because it's so new that there hasn't been enough time to compile you know, accurate data or have you seen anything like that? I mean, I'm not sure. Well, my response to that would be a little bit more cynical, um, but I've always been a question of science and data. I would say that there's no data yet because the proper agency hasn't uh, paid for the data to prove their point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we see, we see this one study being masqueraded around that says that airplanes are safe and it was funded by the Department of Defense. At, and who paid for that? The airline agencies. And everyone's using that as data now. Let's look who's paying for these studies. Because I'll yeah. make a study tomorrow uh, you know, from a group that says that dining in restaurants is safe. All I got to do is pay the right scientist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Third well, I mean, review data. That's what we need to see. Well, I mean, this the same the same doctor was talking about earlier that I talked about with like the the, the smoke analogy. The same guy was talking about how we need to get have kids in school. Um, even, socially distanced. Yes, wearing mask. I think he had like, like three W's. Like you know, wear a mask. You know, um, I can't remember what the other. Wash your hands and then, you know, watch out for your. Surround. I'm not sure what it was, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Was that a, a psychologist or a medical doctor? <laughs> yeah, it was. A, I, he wasn't a psychologist. You know, I, 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 I should have written it down who it was, but um, he, he understood the the, the transmission, uh, and he understood, you know, airflow and ventilation. Uh, but he was he was a doctor of some. Like, I think he was a medical doctor, but. I'll have to look it up. I'll, I'll see a link to it. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a good talk, though, because it, it supported a lot of the stuff you've been talking about. I always think about that scene in, uh, was it was it Caddyshack, where Chevy Chase is walking around the locker room? He's like, doctor, doctor. doctor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, man. Well, um, anything else before uh, – any kind of final words you want to give of inspiration or thoughts for those that are out there you know, watching right now that are maybe struggling? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think right now it's more about just making it matter. If all of us can do just something small, then one of us doesn't have to do something big. That's really what it comes down to. Um, and that can be small in regards to just supporting our local community, restaurants, small businesses, not not using third-party deliveries. to something small like just, you know, an, ind an individual act of defiance. Now, I'm not saying defiance in the sense of like not wearing masks, et cetera. What I'm saying is supporting those who are following the proper data and the proper science in order to, you know, keep the economy stimulated without putting anybody at risk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
at the end of the day, if, if everything closes back down, it's going to be obviously even worse. And and having, I mean, to, to think to retrain to to get new inventory. I mean, these are things that the average person doesn't really think about. But when yeah, I've opened a restaurant, you've opened plenty of restaurants. There's um, a lot of things that go into opening up a restaurant, and um, yeah. and uh, it'd be obviously catastrophic. So, um, well. Andrew, y'all, you're speaking of doing, uh, everybody doing a little bit. You're doing uh, a lot, man. You, uh, you guys, the uh, GoFundMe. I have the link here uh, for folks that are um, that are uh, that can help. Uh, we know uh, a lot of folks are struggling right now, but if you can't help, um, I know that they'd support it, and the industry would as well. Um, if, if folks are maybe in that in that need um, group, are you? allowing for people to reach out to you guys or, or how are you doing yeah. that up? Yeah. Just reach out to me over email, Andrew Gruel at gmail.com or in, on any social app. And we're going to start distributing funds shortly. Um, you know, just, just, it's, it's, you know, tell your story. Any points of verification is helpful and we take it from there. That's awesome, man. Well, uh, keep up the good work. Y'all definitely check them out. Uh, Slapfish and um, follow, give them a follow everywhere, but especially Twitter, Instagram here on Facebook. But uh, thanks buddy for spending some time with me, man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Good to meet with you. All right, brother. Take care, man. Thanks. Bye.